I know Tim has a whole uh, table of books back there. I'm not that good, uh, but I did build out a couple years ago a digital library of videos on church growth. It's called break200.com. I think they have a slide for that. It'll just, uh, I, I'm, I'm not as smart as Tim, so I can't write books, but I can do videos on some church growth stuff. And I'm not sure if they, if they have that or not, but it's basically a library of coaching and training videos. Think about this, like Netflix, but for your team and for yourself to grow your church past the 200 barrier. Um, it's all on break200.com if they don't have the, the graphic. It's just break200.com, which is a very easy domain name to remember. I am honored to be able to share four quick things. Are we breaking at, at noon? Is that when we're breaking? Is it noon? Okay, great. I'm gonna have my wife pray through some things. I just know that there's some practical places of um, <clears throat> attack. And I think it's important that we pray through these things. Did they find that graphic or no? Did I send it, did I text it to you or no? I must have texted the wrong number. That's my fault if I'd ever texted it to the right number. Romans chapter eight, if I was stranded on an island and I can only take one chapter, probably Romans chapter eight, wouldn't you agree? We've been in the Old Testament this morning. Let's transition to the New Testament. And let's look at what Paul says in Romans chapter eight. Beginning in verse 31. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen. The board member will. <laughs> but it is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is not on fantasy football. He's interceding for us. Oh my goodness. Let's stand and read this last, these last four verses together. I know you've been up and down like the Catholic church today, but <laughs> this is so powerful. This is a question. Here, here it is, verse 35. Verse 35 says this, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword. Verse 36, as it is written, for your sake, come on, we face death all day long. That's just a Tuesday in our line of work. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, come on, like a, like a conqueror. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Verse 38, for I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height or depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. You may be seated. I'd like to talk to you really quickly about four questions. Four questions to ask when you're under attack. They have that, that graphic now, but you can scan it if you'd like. But I'd like to talk to you about four questions to ask when you're under attack. Why don't you just stay with me while we're, while we're up here? Because I'm not going to be up here for very long. How many of you have been attacked before? I can remember the the most real church attack. I mean, there's attacks and then there's like, there's like demonic attacks, like over your body and over your marriage and over your children. But then there's like weird church people attacks. 
countdown video has started. It's about five minutes before the service on a Sunday one time. I realized this day why the mega church preachers stay in the room until the third song <laughs> after what I'm about to tell you, justified. I'm sitting in my normal spot, five minute countdown. I'm about to, you know, preach until the paint falls off the walls. We had just recently merged with a legacy Assemblies of God church. Our church plant came into their building. It was a thousand seats. They had 90 people left. So they were slow leak on the way down. We came a hungry, energetic, paint the walls black, skinny jeans, big screens, haze machines church <laughs> into this very traditional model. And imagine this, not everybody was a fan. So the countdown is, is starting. I'm in my spot getting ready to preach right there where you guys are at. Lady comes up to me, looks me dead in the eye. And this is what she says, countdown starting, church about to start. She looks at me and she says, I hate everything about you. She said, since you become our preacher, I get sick to my stomach when I come through the church's parking lot. You've ruined my church and I have no more friends. I had to preach it for four minutes. This wasn't a meeting. This wasn't an email. Face to face, eye to eye with the meanest lady I've ever met. I don't know if you've been through something like that before, but we need to realize how do we respond to attacks? And that attack is such a light coat compared to what Paul went through that I think we could take our cue from Paul because here's the deal. Being attacked is inevitable, but being defeated is unacceptable. Let me say that one more time. Being attacked is inevitable, but being defeated, unacceptable. You cannot come into this room or leave this room defeated today. Why? More than a conqueror. Yes. Paul reminds us. And the chances of you having gone to jail or being beat up for the ministry are pretty low right now. I'm not saying that that might not come in our lifetime. I'm just saying like right now, in comparison to Paul, we're fine. All right, our problems are minute compared to what Paul went through. So we are no longer going to be victims of our circumstances, but we are going to be victors through the cross. Let me just declare this over your life. You're no longer a victim. Oh, they, not just, they, can't, can't, they just put me in this old country church out here. Just can't, we just can't seem to get nobody to come in. You are no longer a victim of your circumstance. Right. You said yes to that assignment, and if God's hand is on that assignment, you better gird up your loins. Yes. All right? I know the music's terrible. I know they always show up late. I know they never sit in the front. I know your live stream breaks every Sunday. I know you can't get the kids' check-in printers to work. You are not a victim. Stop with the victim mentality. You are not a victim of the pandemic. It's, it's 10 years ago that's when COVID happened. All right? Stop blaming COVID. You're not allowed to anymore. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm letting him in. If I hear someone blame COVID, I'm like, dude, that was a long time ago. And we're in Tennessee. <laughs> like, if you're in Detroit or Chicago, maybe. No more victim mentality. No more victim mentality. You signed up. You knew what was available to you. You knew the circumstances. There might have been a few more skeletons in the closet that they didn't show you during your interview, but you knew what you were signing up for when you were called. So no more victim mentality. If you planted a church, no more victim mentality. I'm just a church planter. You signed up to plant it. Nobody held you hostage until you planted that church. You signed up for it. So no more... I'm just going to pastor you a little bit today. So there's four questions that I ask when I get under attack. Number one, if God is for us, who could be against us? <laughs> Straight from Paul. Four questions. I think they have it on the screen. Four questions to ask. If God is for us, who could be against us? <sighs> this is the opposition question. If you're facing opposition right now, be reminded, if God is for you, who could be against you? If God is for you, who can be against you? There is a great war tactic and our opposition is very simple. I'm not gonna complicate this today. 
But your opposition comes in three forms. Number one, the flesh. But if God is for you, who can be against you? My flesh will not win. My flesh is not going to win. My anger, my disappointment, my frustration, not going to win. Take a nap. I, I had a challenging conversation with my staff, and I, I told myself, I'm going to sleep on this before I have this conversation. I'm going to sleep on it, and I've added a second, I've added three components to making sure that I don't go off the handles in my flesh. I'm going to sleep, I'm going to eat, and I'm going to go to the gym. Because if I can, if I take all my frustration out on the bench press, when I go to meet with them, all of that fleshly desire will be a little bit more diminished. It doesn't mean that I'm not human. I just try to let my spirit get some time to surface and my flesh get some time to diminish. Say no to flesh, say yes to faith. Your, the, your flesh is the opponent in your life. You have to admit it sometimes. You have to say this, I was wrong. Sometimes I just look at her and I say, I was in my flesh. That happens every day. Every hour on the hour. Like commercial breaks during Rush Limbaugh. It's just always, he always ends at the same time. It's like, I was wrong. I was in the flesh. Every hour on the hour. You have to say, our opposition is the flesh. Number two is the devil. The enemy is real. It's not some made up fictional Halloween character. He's after your marriage. If he can't stop your ministry, he'll try to stop your marriage. And he, since he can't take your salvation, he'll try to take your significance. And since he can't defeat you, he'll try to distract you. You need to understand that the enemy is real and he's after you. So when you say yes to God, you need to know that he puts a target on your back. Thank God we have authority. If God is for us, who could be against us? The flesh can't, or devil can't, and neither can the world. The world. So I'd like my wife to pray for anyone facing opposition today. If you're facing opposition in your flesh, if you're facing opposition from your church, if you're facing opposition from your own family, if you're facing opposition from the enemy, as if spiritual, a spirit of heaviness maybe is on your ministry, right now, would you just open up your hands? We're just gonna pray right now for any opposition to be gone in Jesus' name. Holy Spirit, we thank you that we are more than conquerors. And I pray against every attack of the enemy over these men and women of God right now in the name of Jesus, that it would cease to exist. I pray that it would fall to the wayside in the name of Jesus, that it would be returned to sender in the name of Jesus. I pray, God, for every demonic force that is coming against these churches and these pastors and, these, and their families, God, I pray against it in the name of Jesus. We know that by your name that they shall be removed. I pray, God, that you would give us faith, great boldness to walk out as a conqueror over the enemy, that he is under our feet, Lord Jesus. I pray that we would not leave here with a spirit of defeat, Lord God, but that we would leave here with a conquering mindset, that we would know that we are yours, we are chosen by you, we are appointed by you for this season, in this season, with these people. And I pray, God, that you would give us wisdom to rise above the challenges. I pray that you would give us a fervor and a steadfastness in our spirit to go against the grain, to go against the opposition, to face the head on knowing that you are with us and that you are sending all of angels armies to go on fight on our behalf. I pray God that you would prepare the way before us in battle Lord Jesus and that you would give us eyes to see in the spiritual realm exactly what is happening oh God that we would not fight in our flesh but that we would fight in our spirit and though we are victors in the faith and we know these truths deep in our hearts I pray that you would forgive us when we don't live them out. I pray that you would forgive us when we want to quit, that you would forgive us when we want to walk away from what you have gifted us to do. You have not called every single individual to lead this church and to lead these people and to lead our families. You have chosen us for this moment in time. So let us not waver in our faith. Let us not um, be doubtful, God, but let us stand secure. Let us not compromise. Let us not look to the left or to the right. Let us not try to look for greener pastures because you have led us to the one where we can lie down. You have led us to the still water. Let us find restoration in you today. 
Thank you, Lord. That no Thank weapon you, formed against us will prosper. Amen. And we are more than conquerors in you. Amen. Amen. Second question is this. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. I love this. How will he not also along with him graciously give us some things? No, all things. So we have the opposition question that we just prayed over. Now we have the provision question. You know that God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. You know that, right? I just want to pray for Jehovah Jireh to become real in your personal finances today. I know that that's one of the major concerns in ministry today is the lack, the spirit of lack, the poverty mentality. We're going to break that off. I'm not talking about prosperity gospel today. I'm talking about our God owns everything. And it says here, can you put the, yeah, this is what it says. He who did not spare his own son gave him up for us all. How will he not also? So salvation first, right? Provision second. How will he not also along with Jesus, Jesus also give you all things. So you not only get salvation, you get actual stuff. Like you get blessed. I'm not talking about blab it and grab it, name it and claim it. You'll have a Corvette in your driveway by the time you get home today. I'm talking about a, a real sense of financial provision over your ministries and over your families. I really believe that. We first have to look at our first provision, which is salvation, our primary provision. We got to thank God that he saved us. Like our first provision, I think, I think it's in the notes today. Our, our, the greater provision is our salvation. The lesser provision is our stuff or satisfaction, but they both count. Obviously, we, so obviously, God doesn't have to bless you with another thing because he gave you salvation. And I'd live under a bridge as long as I was saved. And I wouldn't need health insurance as long as I'm saved. But he didn't stop at just saving you. He wants to also bless you. And there's some stewardship discipline that's involved in managing what God already has given you. And so I would encourage you that if you're not saving for retirement, maybe we start saving for retirement. I would encourage you that if you're uh, not on a, on a budget, on a, on a balanced budget, get on a balanced budget. I would encourage you if you're not putting money away for emergencies, do so. There might be some stewardship. My dad, my dad was healed from a back injury a long time ago. And he said, son, if I don't steward this miracle, the pain will return. He understood that the miracle happened in a moment, but the management of that miracle happened over stewardship of his physical body. The same is true for your finances. God might bless you one time, but if you don't steward that miracle, it might not return. And God has been incredibly good to our family. It, I could tell you story after story after story. I remember I used to be the one that brought home the trash bag full of bagels and, 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 and I'd go back to Panera Bread if God called me to it and if I needed to. But God's provision over our life is absolutely astounding because we've remained in that stewardship cycle of not just tithing, but going above and beyond. We've made a commitment to always try to be within the top five givers of our church. And let me, give, let me tell you something. The larger the church gets, the harder that list is to make. If there were 12 people, we could probably make that list. But our, we got, now we got doctors and lawyers and, you know, people making serious cheddar. And we're having to really stretch ourselves to keep making that list. And I'm not saying this to brag. I'm, I, I can speak freely to you because you're my family. But what I'm telling you is we have committed to allowing God to always be our provider and to being at the top of that list. Last week, we wrote our, the largest single check we've ever written to our church in 11 years. And, and we did that because we know it's going to return to us. We already know that. But if you're not living that out practically, start. I would encourage you, if you're not tithing, start tithing. I don't know what the district requirement is here, but I give my district above and beyond the district requirement. Why? Because I'm not about to rob God. It's not my money anyways. So I'm not, I've got to get a calculator. Okay, what is 80% of my 10%? Got to go to Dr. Rick Ross, not the rapper, but the, our superintendent. Oh, we, we write it. And then our church, you know what our church does? Our church goes above and beyond. 
and we all pay our minister's tithe, but then our church supports the district at 1% of every general fund dollar that comes in. We're, I don't know if you guys have a one fund like that, like we do our 1% fund. We, we, we give above and beyond the minister's tithe. Why? I'm not about to rob God. And wouldn't you know it, every time I give, I tend to always get a raise. Wouldn't you know it? Every time I give, someone calls and says, hey, we've taken care of your kids' uh, uh, tuition. My, my kids go to a very expensive school. I don't know why education is so expensive, but better than, I guess, the alternative, which is public school or jail. And so <laughs> had a guy in the church say, hey, our kid's been going to your kid's school, but he graduated, but we've built it into our budget to always pay a tuition. So we're going to move our son's tuition now that he's graduated to your son. My son goes to an all-boys all, all school. And the guy paid the tuition. And this is not a, not like a little homeschool co-op. We're talking like a legit all-boys school tie, the whole thing. Why? Because when you're, when you say, God, you can have it all. I'm not holding anything back. But God will provide for you. I know that, listen, I grew up on the mission field, y'all. Third generation Assemblies of God missionary kid. I don't know anything about trust funds. We knew no one in North Carolina. There was nothing waiting for us there. Nothing at all. But we've always just said, Lord, we trust you. I've watched my dad drive nine hours and do a five minute window at a church for a $50 love offering. Dad, that doesn't make sense. It takes, it, we spend more at McDonald's as a family of six than the offering was at this church that you just preached at after driving us nine hours. He said, son, the Lord will always provide. You need to know. He is Jehovah Jireh. Yes. He is Jehovah Jireh. I know it, it, like we say this every Sunday when we receive the offering, but we got to start believing it. We got to start acting on it. Yes. He, I, I think I have the definition of Jehovah Jireh on there. It's the Lord will provide. Yes. I, I just pray over every young married couple in here struggling. Your, your, your pastor pays you $12,000 a year and expects you to work full time. <laughs> I'm praying for you. I've been there. Our tax return the first year uh, of our church plant journey was we made $18,000. Family of five. How do you survive on $18,000? Our giving report, we gave 5,000 of the 18,000 to the church. We literally $13,000. I have no idea how I'm standing here today, except for the fact that we just ate bagels every single day. And we got really, really, really good at looking to God to be our provider. You gotta live it out. If you're not prepared for, the, for retirement, you need to prepare for retirement. A, an epidemic is hitting our movement of pastors who are not prepared to relinquish the microphone simply because they did not save enough for a long enough period of time. Mm. This isn't a, a, a dog on anyone. I'm just telling you, it's 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 a it's a it's a countrywide, not just not just the assemblies of God. There's a there's going to be a mass exodus of pastors that have waited too long, and their churches are now too small for a young person to take them. So prepare yourself for succession yes. now. Yes. Now. Yes. Sit with your board and say, listen, when I hit this age, I would like to start a transition plan. Start doing that now. Listen, my grandfather is with the AG still. He's 88 years old. He does not stop. He still preaches. Every night of the week, he finds a Spanish church. He's preaching Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Finds the weirdest places. <laughs> Grandpa, why don't you retire? Oh, no, I'm never going to retire, man. I'll just re retire when I die, you know? <laughs> but he's prepared that if he needs to step back, he can. He chooses not to. That's fine the Lord still has more in the tank, but may we never rob the local church yes. of their next season right. due to our lack of discipline for yes. saving for the future. Yes. Yes. Okay. And I say this with all due respect, I'm, again, with all due respect, but I got plans. I want to play golf, dude. <laughs> I want to play golf and I want to kill deer. And I don't want to have to prepare a message every single Sunday and worry about preaching to the pockets of people because I won't be able to survive till the end of my life. So you need to sit down. You need to get prepared. You need to find someone that's done this before and you need to create a succession plan. And may this be the word of the Lord for some of you today. You need to start saving for retirement now. You need to start putting it away right now. Don't rely on anything else. Oh, our, the house value will be fine. Not enough. Not enough unless you live in like a $10 million house. I guess around here that's possible. <laughs> 
you need to save. And also, I, I, I'm going long too long for this one, but I just, I'm very passionate about seeing you financially blessed. You need to make sure that you're living with such good stewardship that if the church saw your personal bank account, they wouldn't be shocked at some of the spending habits or some of the lack of giving that exist within your own personal life. I would encourage you with that the Lord will provide. And I know many of you are probably struggling financially in a room this size with churches of different sizes and different contexts and different backgrounds and a lot of bivocational people really hustling and, and huffing it out. I've been there. I know what that is like. I watched my parents struggle. I watched my parents still struggle, to be honest. For over 30 years, they're still struggling right now. And I want you to know God will provide. God will provide. Would you pray that God would provide for them financially and bless their families? Well, God, first I pray against the spirit of fear. The spirit of fear that keeps us bound up in a reality that is not faith-filled. I pray, God, that you would just empower us with a spirit of faith to see finances and to view financial matters as you see them, God, as kingdom resources, the cattle on a thousand hills. Your supply is limitless, God, and we seek you as our Jehovah Jireh right now in this moment. I pray that you would give us wisdom to navigate financial situations in our personal lives and in our church. Lord God, that you would call us to be good stewards, Lord Jesus, that we would be faithful stewards, that we would lead our people by example, oh God, that the world would not look to the church as a place of poverty, but that it would look to a place of provision, that they would see the glory of God pre prevail and revealed through our churches and through our leadership, God, as we steward the kingdom resources that you trust and bestow to us. I pray, God, that they would see your glory revealed through every decision that we make. God, I pray that you would provide for every pastor in this room. I pray, God, that they would bear witness to your faithfulness right now. I pray for those that are in a season of lack, God, that they would know with great faith that their season of provision is right around the corner, God. For you are a God who meets our needs. You are a God who hears the cries of our people. And as we are faithful to do what you have called us to do, we know that the harvest is around the corner. We know that our labor is not in vain and we know that every seed that is sown will produce a harvest. So we cling tight to your truth today, God. We cling, we cling tight to our Jehovah Jireh and we trust you for the provision. We do not operate in a spirit of fear. We operate in a spirit of faith in Jesus' name. Amen. Third question that Paul presents to us is who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? This is the accusation question, and this is where many leaders live between their ears. I'm unqualified. I can't do it. I'm not good enough. My jeans aren't skinny enough. LED wall ain't nice enough. My worship team ain't good enough. My church is just in a bad area. You live in this constant state of accusation between your ears and you need to know that no one can bring charges against a victorious mind. The battle is mostly fought between your ears. It's a mind game. You say, I'm not good enough. I'm not talented enough. Your mind is actually, it needs to be renewed so that you can live victorious. Some of you are living in your past sin. You say, there's no way God can use me now because of what I did then. That is the accusation of the enemy and you have to send it back to the pit of hell. Satan is called the father of lies and the accuser of the brothers and sisters in Revelation because the two main weapons he will do is he will deceive you and he will try to bring up your past. He will try to bring up the things that you did in your early days, in your, in your former life. And let me tell you right now, no weapon formed against you shall prosper over your mind. If you've been in a dark place, I've been in a dark place. If you've been in a dark place, I decree a renewed mind in Jesus. Who can bring the charges against you? No one. Who, no one can accuse you because you have a renewed mind in Jesus' name. COVID was really hard for all of us and COVID was especially hard for me on my mind. As a leader, I like being in control, right? They asked me if I wanted a headset microphone or a handheld microphone today. And I said, well, if I have to cough or sneeze, I won't have control, you know, the headset microphone. I, I'm obsessed with control. So I felt like every, all the control was taken away from us 
during COVID. My mind got to a very dark place. She can testify and our staff can testify. It was so bad. I was in such a dark place mentally that when I showed up to work, I would be in such a bad spirit. They, the staff created a second name for me, depending on which version of me showed up to the office. They would say, Miguel is here, which is my name in Spanish. And if Miguel was there, they meant stay away. He's, he's, he's tormented. I'm like Saul tormented in my mind. Don't let the enemy have your mind. Don't let the enemy have your thoughts. Do not get some sun sunlight. Walk, walk around the, the track. Get on the treadmill. Let your mind be clear. Take a deep breath sometimes. Just like let yourself be fully understood. Your battle is right here. Because he cannot take your salvation, you're already saved. We're all covered by the blood, by the way, in case you're wondering. Did you know that? Nothing can separate us from the love of God. But but he will try to get you in here. He will try. He, he can't take your salvation, but he'll try to take your significance. He cannot defeat you, but he will try to distract you. Get your mind right. I, I have to, I, we have four children living in our house. My number one goal, taking them to school every single day. How's your mind? What are you thinking about? Whatever's pure, holy, whatever's righteous, whatever's right, whatever's godly, we think about those things. We will not obsess about things that we cannot control. We will not obsess about things. We will not let the enemy win in our minds. And, and some of us, uh, our ministry is in a rut because our mind is in a rut. And if we just looked our eyes to the hills, where does our help come from? Our help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth, the one that does not slumber, the one that does not sleep. Renew my mind. Renew my mind. Renew my mind. Renew my mind. Mm. Because he cannot mess with the ultimate victory, he tries to get you to have a victim mentality. But no one can bring these charges against you because you are more than a conqueror. Would you pray for the mental health of every minister and the mindset of every pastor here and their team that they would have a renewed mind? God, right now we cancel the spirit of comparison. Holy Spirit, we release that spirit to you. We recognize that this is not a competition, that we are in this together, that we are all playing for the same team to establish your kingdom here on the earth as it is in heaven. So I cancel the spirit of comparison where no longer will we be plagued in our minds with what this person is accomplishing and what we are not. For we know that we are all running the same race in the same direction towards your purpose and your glory. And I pray God that we would cancel that spirit of comparison. We would cancel that spirit of competition. I pray that we would recognize in our thoughts and in our minds that we are here for you and you alone, for your purpose, that you have called us uniquely and individually to accomplish during our time here on this earth. God, we are completely submitted to you, to your spirit, to your voice of truth, to your voice of reason. And I pray, God, that you would release us from the lie of the enemy, oh God, that we have to be compared to this person or that. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would give us a sound mind, that we would not operate in a spirit of fear, Lord Jesus. Jesus, but we would be released from that torment. We would be released from those tormenting thoughts. I speak against depression and anxiety right now in the name of Jesus. I pray, God, that you would lift our spirits. I pray that we would lift our eyes to know that you are where our help comes from. I pray that you would release us from that darkness, release us from that deep pit, God, and set our feet upon a solid rock once more. I pray that sorrow would be broken off of us in the name of Jesus and that a conquering spirit would replace it. Let us rise from the ashes and find new life in you again, God. Renew our spirit, renew our minds and bring peace to the chaos. Bring peace by your still small voice, God. Whisper clearly that we may articulate clearly what you have called us to accomplish through every ministry that's represented in this room. For we're not serving ourselves and we're not serving man. We are here to serve an almighty God. We're here for your purpose. And let us fix our eyes on that truth and cling tightly to that truth that we are yours. We belong to you and we submit to you fully. No more comparison, no more competition. We are kingdom-minded people. And let your will be done here on the earth 
in us and through us in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for renewed minds. The fourth and final question is who shall separate us from the love of Christ? This is the love question. You are not your attendance data. You are not the number of services you have or the number of Instagram followers you have or subscribers, comments, likes, or how cool the facility is, even though this one is really cool. You are loved by God because you are a son and daughter of God. Before you ever held a microphone or a credential, before you ever chaired a board meeting, son and daughter, son and daughter of God. Nothing you do performance-based can separate you from the love of God. That's why my ministry is completely unrelated to my sonship. I leave the ministry tomorrow, still a son of God. I, I, I sell Lexuses tomorrow, son of God that sells Lexuses. Yes. Just so happens to be that I'm in the ministry, but the love of God is not contingent That's right. on my ministry. That's right. You need to understand this today. There's no scoreboard up in heaven. He's not like, oh, good job today. You preached so good. I'm so proud of you. He loved you before you ever knew what the Bible was. He loves you so much. He's obsessed with you. My dad, uh, I used to play t-ball. And whenever I got on base, um, which was very rare, I'm not very athletic, but he would say it loud enough so that I, he would be in the stands and he would say it loud enough so that I could hear it. He would say, whose boy is that? Whose boy is that? Whose boy is that? He'd say, whose boy is that? And he, he knew whose boy it was, but he was affirming in my primal little soul as a young man that my father sees me and loves me. Yes. And I prophesy to you today, yes. whose boy is that? Whose daughter is that? Who is that that just got off base? Who is that? Same thing happens to me. My son's playing basketball. I'm yelling at him. He's on. He's, he's ninth grade, starting varsity, ninth grade. He's, he is athletic. And I said, shoot your shot. Get back on defense. Don't pass it to that kid. He sucks. <laughs> kids moms right there I'm like yeah he does I'm just kidding that's just a joke that's just a joke that's just a joke I did get a technical foul only one time but they were after they were triple teaming him every time anyways I asked him on the way home in the truck I said can you hear me when I'm talking to you while you're on the court because you got to think coaches is coaching him. You're not technically supposed to be the parent coach. I'm that guy. I'm trying to be better. You got to think there's crowd, all this going on. It's chaos. And I, I, in the truck, he gets in the truck after the game. And I said, can you hear me when I talk to you? Do you hear my voice when I'm yelling at you from the stands to shoot your shot or to get back on defense or, you know? He said, dad, your voice is the only voice I hear. May the love of God supersede any noise yes. that's currently happening in your ministry. Yes. May the love of God yes. be so clear that you could go through any trial or valley or dark season because you can hear the voice yes. of God. May you be able to experience the love of God at a measure you've never experienced it before. Not based on your performance, not based on your striving, not based on your accolades or degrees or accomplishment, simply because he fashioned you together in your mother's womb. He loves you today. He has your hairs numbered. He doesn't just know how many hairs you have. He knows that if you pulled one out, which hair that would be. Big difference. 
Hard to count, but even harder to have them numbered. Stand to your feet. Let's just ask God to pour out his love upon us. I'm going to ask the presbytery and any of the leaders to position themselves in the aisles and in the hallways and maybe in the back area. Just find a place. There's not, there, there's not too much space, but we're pastors. We don't have to get weird. Like the, This geographical location isn't the only sacred space. Anywhere you go, you can experience the love of God. If you say, I need, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with those four questions. I have accusers. I, 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 I need to remind myself that I'm more than a conqueror. I need to remind myself that God is my provider. I need to be reminded that he is my father. I, I, Paul's cue to us is these four questions. And if that's you, I just want you to, to just begin to ask God to pour out his love. Ask God to renew your mind. Ask God to, to diminish the attack that's happening in your life. What do we, what do, we do then? We, we say, God, you are more. You are more. We are more than conquerors. We, 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 say, we say these four questions. If God is for us, who can be against us? We say this, he who did not spare his own son gave him up for us all. How will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? If you need provision today, you're in the right place. Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? If you've been accused of anything today, know this, you are chosen by God. No accuser in Jesus' name. Lastly, what shall separate us from the love of Christ? Nothing, nothing, nothing. God's love is not based on feelings, it's based on facts. So I want you right now, if you say that word was for me, just, just wave your hand. You say that word was for me. Maybe this morning's word was for you. You say this morning's word earlier today was for me. Whatever it was, I want you to make your way and find someone to pray with right now. This is a safe place. You're not gonna be judged. You're not gonna be degraded or belittled for making your way to the front or to the sides. But now is the time to pray. Now is the time right now before we break for lunch. Make your way. Find yourself someone to pray with right now. Find yourself someone to pray with. She